right, now, now comes the point that to some extent we've all been waiting for, um, is we're going to put our three um, eminent speakers on the spot. Um, we're going to ask them if they can possibly reach an agreement between them, which would be great. Um, no problems if we can't. Um, and if the speakers are happy, you're welcome to all three of you to unmute, although I will ask Bill to start, Phoebe second, Chris third. Um, but if there was something that you wanted to just interject while somebody's talking, if it's possible to do it without us getting out of control, that's great, because we'd like to sort of have a debate. So, okay, great. If I could just then, I think we've sort of do it in three bits. So if we start with simply looking at what we think a um, scientifically defensible, sustainable world population figure would be, and then we'll move on to the whys and wherefores afterwards. So Bill, over to you first. Well, this is a hugely important question and there are so many variables that fit into it. it it's difficult to make any kind of definitive answer. It depends on, for example, what is a desirable standard of living? Obviously, if you have uh, twice as many people living at carrying capacity, you'll have half the standard of living you will have if you have half as many people. So the ultimate population is a, is a factor of the productivity of the planet uh, combined with the desirable standard of living. So Christopher, I think, has come up with a reasonable number assuming a certain material standard. I think we're headed for fewer than three billion, something like one to two billion, because we've degraded the carrying capacity of the planet so much. People forget that we're not starting here with a, a fresh, uh, of planet Earth. We're seeing baseline drift. So if, if you just look at the rate at, at, at which uh, human competitive displacement of non-human life has taken place, it gives you an indicator of how far we've come here. 10,000 years ago, human beings accounted for less than 1% of the biomass, the weight of mammals on planet Earth. Uh, today, we are uh, about 32% of a much larger biomass, but our domestic animals account for another 64% or thereabouts. So wild nature is now displaced to somewhere between two and 5% of the total biomass of mammals. Humans and their domestic animals account for the other 96% or so, plus or minus is several studies that dispute what the margins look like here. But the fact is that human beings have become the dominant species on the planet. And yet, to go to a point I think that Jane made over and over again, we are run by mythology. So today, a dominant myth is that there's no conflict between the growth of the human enterprise and the maintenance of environmental quality. Every major politician I've ever listened to on this question has asserted that point. And it's absolute nonsense. Another myth, the human economy, as technology advances, is decoupling from the environment. This is absolute and utter nonsense if you look at actual energy and material flows. So we have this complete disconnect between what the data are showing us and what rational analysis says we should do and what we are doing out of constructed myths that have no basis in reality. So I can't underscore more how false it is to think that we have reason at foot here. Human beings are not primarily a rational species. We are primarily a species that goes according to myths, and those myths incorporate that which we would like to be, not that which is. And that's the situation we are in today. So just to, to, to get back to my main point, we've so degraded the biocapacity of the earth that whereas we might have supported 3 billion people in 1970, I doubt very much that we could do so today at any kind of material standard uh, that people would uh, come to appreciate it. We have to get out of the notion of acting out of our myths and start paying attention to the real data. And that is the single greatest barrier, it seems to me, uh, confronting us, that we are incapable of acting on the evidence because it confounds or, or frustrates achieving that which we wish were the case. Thank you, Bill. Well, Phoebe, so starting from Bill's uh, main um, supposition that it's one to two billion. Would you like to now follow and comment on that? I'm comfortable with starting at three and, and, and adapting. We do need goals. They're very helpful for quantifying and you know setting public policy as well as personal decisions. 
Um, I'm, I'm not so much concerned about the precise goal as the fact that we take a decision to move there. A lot of what Bill says about, uh, about standard of living is very important. Now, I grew up like many of us with frugal parents and there's nothing more important than the West um, bearing in mind uh, the, the need to move to a mindset of sufficiency. You know, living in Southern Africa where most people are comfortable with sufficiency, back to the US where I was born and raised, where not only personal mindsets of entitlement and consumption and convenience and, um, and status and accumulation of stuff are, are overwhelming in, in many people, not, certainly not everybody, um, but also the system set up to deliver resources. I moved into a house where it's really hard to open the tap a little bit. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, you know, having lived in the driest country south of the Sahara, Namibia, for 14 years, I find it galling the way society is often constructed to waste. So we've got to move from our wasteful mindsets in the rich northern countries towards a mindset, but also the social and logistical structures for sufficiency. Um, I, I think I will leave it there for now. Okay, great, Phoebe. Coming to you, Chris, but I just like also seeing somebody's comment as well. Um, we, we, we started today because from scientists' warnings, we have that we should have a scientifically definable sustainable population goal. Um, so that's what we're looking for. Um, in addition, just from, from my experience of a lot of the work on climate, biodiversity, et cetera, is that without focus on a specific goal, it's very difficult to create plans to get there. Um, and that you sort of need to have a goal, even if the goal is revised at some point in the future as being wrong or can be corrected because you have new information, you need a goal in order to start the steps. And, and that if all you do is start walking towards a goal that you haven't defined, I don't tend to see that as working terribly well as a policy. But anyway, my opinion, Chris, over to you, you're much more of an expert than me. Um, so one to two billion um, from Bill. Um, Phoebe, starting with three billion, but coming back to maybe action towards the goal is the first thing we should be doing. Where are you on this? Yeah, uh, I mean, I kind of feel like uh, we're all members of the same club, you know, uh, we have kind of you know, different opinions on various pieces, you know, once somebody agrees that uh, 7.8, 7.9 billion is unsustainable, that we exceeded our Earth's carrying capacity and we need to bring it down, you're all members of the same club at that point, right? Then it is, how do you bring the population curve, uh, you know, downward? Um, where you stop, uh, I think, then becomes a, a reasonable discussion, but it's actually a discussion that we would have several decades to work through. Um, and, you know, that's one reason why, you know, I've got this chapter that uh, I entitled Reimagining Economics for an Era of Degrowth. Many degrowth economists will say we must degrow. And I just say, well, we're, you're gonna when the population curve bends and it's either going to bend, as, as Bill said, it's either going to be a precipitous collapse um, or it's going to be a manageable curve. So how do you bring in a manageable curve? Because nobody wants a precipitous collapse um, that averts like the awful peak. Uh, personally, nine, nine billion just from uh, nine billion makes me very nervous. Um, I think the, the climate community has done a good job of pointing out, you know, the higher the temperature gets, uh, the uh, higher the probability of disasters, the greater the magnitude those disasters will be, the, uh, the, the higher the frequency they will be. And that's not just a climate thing. That's for all of these ecological disasters, right? I think 9 billion puts us in very treacherous territory. So when IMH, uh, IMHG uh, wrote in Lancet, we'll hit 9.7 billion in 2064 and the curve will go down, uh, that gave me no comfort at all. Um, you know, so uh, I think there's a community out there that says, hey, it'll all be good. It's going to go down eventually. And they just haven't asked the question, how many people can they support, which we're here today. So, I mean, the one to two billion uh, number, um, if anything, the only fights I've really had, not fights, but, you know, um, from with folks over my book and my estimates has been on the low side, not on the high side. Nobody's really come in and said, you know, I really think we're, we're going to be fine at eight, nine, 10 or 11. If I have had a couple of people say, you know, my number was four and a half to five, 
but you really made me reconsider it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start thinking that lower might be needed. But on the lower end, you know, I think people have really, really good arguments for which they have really, really good data. Um, I, my argument is twofold. One is I am a technological optimist. And um, I believe just as in kind of the post-World War II era, the nature of capitalism, uh, industrial capitalism shifted, um, our production function, if you will, uh, shifted. And we started using much more noxious, you know, our, our, our use of endocrine disruptors, you know, just exploded. And that was not a thing that really, you know, uh, went on at the same scale beforehand. Um, we can talk about DDT story for which a Nobel prize was awarded to a doctor. I just want to point out, but, um, you know, so, so that production function has shifted. It's probably shifted again. Uh, the seventies were not kind to the world. Um, but that, uh, the same way, I believe that production function can actually shift in a way that uses resources better. How you achieve that shift, um, through regulatory or by spring particular kinds of innovation. I'm a bit of a Schumpeterian when it comes to economics. So I'm big on kind of creative destruction. How do you channel that creative destruction in the economy in a way that um, uh, leads to more you know, uh, helpful production functions while bringing the population down? The second point I'd make is um, we have the opportunity to rewild and protect and uh, unburden our planet even while the population is going up. I mean, we've grown our, our exclusion, you know, maritime protected areas just in recent years. We, it's, it's tough and keeping, you know, rapacious fishing fleets from, in, you know, uh, in, incurring on those uh, zones is hard, but there are things we can do even as the population grows. Um, and I would like to think that we could bend the population curve in a manageable way soon after 2100, depending on how soon, you know, let's say, 2120, you know, get somewhere around 3 billion, maybe it's 4 billion. Um, uh, and the, the entire time we could have spent the century actually unburdening many noxious, you know, uh, you know, things we have foisted onto our planet, so. Right, great. Thanks, Chris. You sort of went fit onto our next question. Uh -oh, uh, sorry about that. You're fine. So you sort of, sort of jumped the gun and got started on it. Um, I just, in terms of targets, I think we're, we're sort of, if I compare this to uh, the UN's targets on net zero emissions of being 2050 as the absolute endpoint for when the planet needs to get to net zero, um, as perhaps being our 3 billion um, figure in comparison on population. Um, whereas scientists warning Europe and many scientific bodies around the world are saying 2030 is the target we need to go to on net zero. And the 2050 target is present on a 66% chance of staying under 1.5 degrees. And the 2030 target is on the basis that we have a very, very good chance of staying under 1.5 degrees. But as Phoebe and you've just said, as we moved on to the sort of the next session is, first thing is to get started on the target. And the UN had told us two years ago, we needed 7.6% reduction every year, which we haven't done. And we're still going up at about 1% a year. So the target gets more and more difficult. In fact, both targets. So, um, just with that then, as, as a bit of background, we'll move back into the same order, although in a sense, because Chris has moved ahead on the question, so, so we could take some of his comments in if you like. And just to say, we, we had said that we were going to be finishing at 6.30, but that we would extend if people would like to stay for another half an hour if these three thorny questions hadn't been answered and, and we'd aired them properly. So um, we will continue. Our, our speakers are happy to do that. So anybody is welcome to stay, of course, for the next half hour. So, so Bill, we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, 3 billion is our 2050 target in a sense compared to climate emissions and uh, our 2030 target is your 1 billion. Um, let's assume we're on our path to get to them. Um, what should we be doing to get there and when should we be aiming to get there? Okay, I have to, before even getting into that question, I've got to go back and, and certainly Christopher is a much more technologically optimistic person than I am. So let me just make a couple of points that, that reframes this question. There is no possibility that we will retain global warming below 1.5 degrees right now. Already in the pipe due to slow positive, rather, rather rapid positive feedbacks, even if carbon emissions were stabilized so that the atmospheric concentration did not increase further, we would see somewhere between 0.6 
and one degree additional warming beyond and above that which we have right now. So let me say again, there is no chance of remaining within a 1.5 degree global warming. And at current rates, we will probably surpass the two degrees of mean global warming, and certainly by 2050. And we're on track actually for three to four degrees. So let's get real about those kinds of numbers. Secondly, none of these uh, so-called solutions being entertained within the mainstream community are going to change any of that because the, the major permissive uh, or, or permitted technological advances, and, and Chris may disagree with me here, such as wind, solar, non-existent carbon and, uh, capture technologies, uh, electric vehicles, all of these things require massive capital investment. They're all constructed using fossil fuels. They're not renewable. They are merely replaceable. Wind towers last in practice about 15 to 20 years tops and have to be replaced on all, uh, uh, solar panels, perhaps 20 to 25 years. So these are technologies that are not going to replace fossil fuels. So we are going to see, no matter which way we go, a much energy poorer world than we have now and we are not going to be able to produce the resources, including the food necessary to sustain 9 billion people, perhaps not even our present population in 2050. So we're in a much more dire situation than anyone is really fully aware of in the international. You see, we think in very narrow reductionist terms. That's how our brains evolve. But we live in a very complex system. Let's just take another trend we've talked about. You saw that graph of the growth of global cities. Cities are made of concrete. Concrete is a huge emitter of carbon dioxide. Just building out the cities to accommodate the anticipated population by 2030 would use the entire global carbon budget. And by the way, some scientists now argue there is no remaining carbon budget if you want to retain uh, mean global warming to within two degrees Celsius. I should also point out that uh, the, insanity of, of the economic models. I said earlier that we believe we're decoupling from nature. Human beings are the single largest component of every major ecosystem on planet Earth, at least any to which we have access. Listen to me carefully. We are the single greatest uh, herbivore and carnivorous animal ever to walk the Earth. That is truth, we can demonstrate it clearly. And yet we are carrying this myth in our minds that we're capable of decoupling from nature and therefore continuing to grow through technology while reducing our total impact. So I, I simply don't agree that that's possible. Every additional human being uh, for the simple reasons of uh, the first and second laws of thermodynamics uses some resources and some energy takes up some space and that means there is less resources, energy, and space available for other species on planet Earth. And that's the situation we are in. Now, I don't even remember what your question was, but I think it's a much more complex context uh, for the question than, than we've been uh, discussing no, so far. It was fantastic. Thank you for that. And we straying onto the whole of the climate um, issue is is needed and required. So thank you. Now, with the, what we're trying to, to sorry, we're trying to come to on the question was. If we're accepting it's a 1.3 to 3 billion, not just accepting, we are all believing that that is the right one. Then how are we going to get there? What's the, what's our strategy for getting there? And really, when should we do it? Because we don't get there till 2200. It's clearly too late. Oh, obviously. Well, I think Jane prevented some very compelling data. I think I've believed in it for some time that we need to have voluntary access to the best possible family planning methods. People will take advantage of it. If you combine that, with education and economic security for women, uh, we would be well on our way. There's another variable here we haven't discussed. This may be a non-issue if male sperm counts continue to decline at the rate the current data are suggesting. Uh, some say that uh, sperm counts will be down to virtually zero by mid-century, in which case we may have massive reproductive failure uh, on the part of the human species. So again, this is an incredibly complex situation. And that problem results exactly from one of the uh, things Christopher was talking about, the release of uh, hormone mimicking uh, compounds in the uh, environment as a result of uh, agriculture and, and various chemical 
the processes. So there are so many parallel lines going here that the human mind is incapable of wrapping itself around any one of these complex issues, let alone the whole. But we have to keep them in mind before moving forward. So my answer is give everybody that we possibly can opportunities for family planning, for birth control, and increase economic security for women. And we can do that while still shrinking the whole. By the way, I mean, a huge barrier here we haven't discussed at all is the power dynamics. Most of our governments are in the thrall of the major corporate sector actors who have no interest whatsoever in anything that we're talking about here, whose entire existence depends on the capitalist motivation of, of growing the economy. And as long as our governments pay more attention to those interests than to the interests of the population at, at whole, uh, to the interests of the planet, then nothing can happen. So we are doubly bound once again in power dynamics, in, in complete ignorance of the actual situation because we're acting out of our myths and the foolish belief that this is going to resolve itself through rational analysis of one kind or another. Any, most of us here are rational people and we think this is what we should do, but there's a huge gulf between knowing what should be done and knowing how to get it to happen in a population that's scientifically ignorant, of politicians who are not only ignorant, but often in deep denial and in the pockets of the corporate sector. This is a hugely complex socio-dynamic uh, problem, uh, quite apart from the ecological and, and climate uh, circumstances that it has led to. Yep. Thank you, Bill. And uh, sorry, go ahead, Phoebe. Well, I think we'll be lucky to have the luxury of being able to achieve nice, smooth policy goals, but none of us want war and pandemics and electromagnetic pulses and uh, chaos in cities to take these decisions for us. As someone who's worked you know, most of my career in national development planning and you know, doing collaborative strategic action plans for various topics from biodiversity to climate change. And uh, you know, I, I've developed a, a government style interest in how we get there from here and uh, how we schedule different actions. My very wise husband is always saying, you can't fix a car while it's driving. Uh, we can fix a lot of the things about this planet while we're driving, but ultimately the global economic engine is hard to stop and pull over in a pit stop and tinker with it and get back on track. Uh, I think many of us, especially those who have lived as I have in Sweden and other uh, social democracies, understand that there's not just a binary system of uh, economic uh, systems to choose from, but uh, I, I'm starting to have to make my peace with uh, kind of tinkering with capitalism as it goes along because much of the world has now ad adopted it. How do we do that in a way that works as fast as is needed for the planet, for the climate and for social justice? <laughs> it, it's a big task. And that's why, as I said to you the other day, Ed, we need people who are really adept at scheduling changes um, so all of these things can happen simultaneously without having to park the economy to one side while we figure it out. Sorry, great. Thanks, Phoebe. Um, Chris, just we're coming down to our last 20 minutes. Um, we'd love to have you coming in on this with a couple of extra comments and things, so please do. Um, and then we'll try and get on to our other major question before we try and address anything else at the end. Over to you. Yeah, um, no, I, I feel... I feel like I agree with everything I uh, just heard. Um, you know, uh, I, my call is for a TFR of 1.5 by 2030. That means before 2030, we need to stop adding people to the planet every year. Right now we add 80 million people to the planet every year, the equivalent of 10 New York cities every single year. That doesn't work. Um, people cry, you know, in newspaper articles about Japan and how they're losing people. Um, Japan's doing pretty darn well as a country. Um, the fact that it lost half a million people over the past couple of years, um, you know, doesn't seem to be, they're not folding up shop and throwing their hands in the air and walking away from life. Uh, it turns out that we can 
uh, put together a policy mix uh, uh, that can deal with a you know, permanent degrowth and we can uh, manage to have personal prosperity and well-being uh, even though we're having a long-term decrease in the number of people that we have and a downsizing in the size of our, of our uh, economy. It, GDP is perhaps the absolute worst measure that anyone ever came up with ever. Um, and, you know, even, you know, economists like Joe Stiglitz, right, you know, are writing books about how GDP is a bad measure. Um, so when you read something in the newspaper that is just another journalist who took another bad undergraduate macroeconomics course and, you know, regurgitating it as like worldly, uh, thoughtful, you know, discourse, it's not. Um, you know, what we need to do is target one point, in my opinion, target 1.5 by 2030 and be declining and decreasing the numbers every year uh, from then on. And I believe there are viable strategies through investing in empowering, you know, ethical, just and empowering strategies toward women and girls. And I don't mean like a little bit. I mean, like, put as much money into that as you're willing to put into a major weapons system at the DOD. Right. If we put the equivalent of the joint strike fighter budget up against this, forget about the Manhattan Project. Right. Something even lower than the Manhattan Project. You'd be shocked at what the outcomes would be. But, you know, we're not having those discussions because nobody set a target with a date. And I think 2030 is the date and it gets you somewhere meaningful by by 2100. Thank you, Chris. And certainly I'm, I'm just coming. Bill. Um, one question. I want you to tell me if he knows a single politician anywhere who's uh, had the kind of conversation that we're having here. I mean, who among them would be willing to set those targets and say so publicly that we have made as a planet a gross error in subscribing wholeheartedly to the infinite growth paradigm. And by the way, it's not just capitalism, it's communism and all the rest of it. We have made a gross error. It is time to turn around. Here is what we must do. And we'll pick on Chris's population target will pick how would that play in the global in in the u.s political system right now what president i think would dare stand up and say such things yeah i think it plays about as well as saying we must avert 1.5 c um you know uh, it, that's a it, by doing what and that's that's a discussion that has not even recognized the population is driving 1.5 c so i mean i feel like that call frankly, has been this weird disembodied call about parts per million of something that's invisible in the air that the average American, frankly, has no clue what the scientific community is talking about. Um, if you say, hey, you know, if we could get down to on average one to two kids per woman instead of on average two to three globally, then we might actually be able to avert bad news in the newspaper every damn day. And, you know, I feel like that's where the scientific community has utterly failed in scientific communication, if you will. Um, you need to make it tractable. And, you know, procreation is the most tractable and, you know, uh, the, the thing that you have the most control over. The fact that, you know, I think as you pointed out, right, I mean, I'm using my words, but we got a people problem, not a climate problem. All those things are, are you know, symptoms of this larger thing. And we're not talking about that thing. So I think we have an opportunity as scientific community to finally put that front and center, not just part of a list. Um, yes, population and com uh, consumption are part of a complex algebra, but you can't you can't like separate the two variables um, and then have that as the adult conversation where investment in empowering strategies toward women and girls aggressively, unbelievably aggressively over the next coming decades is is something that I think should be rather pal you know palatable to many, except for all the people that you know don't want to empower women and girls, and those people exist. Most of the political coterie that are running the world would disallow everything you've just said. Uh, so right, but yet America without immigration is below replacement value. Japan is below replacement value. Thailand is below replacement value. Many and, delightful places are below replacement value. And, and I many, think you, this is part of communication. But many countries like that, including Canada, are desperately trying to recruit immigrants so that we can maintain and grow our population in the face of falling fertility rates. So yeah, absolutely. Okay. You're, you're going to get your immigrants into Canada anyway, <laughs> whether you like it or not. And, yeah. and this is the challenge. You know, the, I, I do think we can change this narrative globally and nationally and at local level and start to look at climate migration 
as an opportunity for those communities and governments that are willing to accept reality and embrace it and integrate migrants into their communities. The alternative is not good and we don't wanna go there. Um, but we've got to look at that as a powerful reason not to encourage people to reproduce. 25 years ago, probably, when I was in Namibia at the cusp of its independence, the founding president, Sam Nyoma, came and said, people, uh, I've come back here from exile in Europe and I see that there are no trees left. What have you done? And the very next year, he said, people, you've got to breed. And then everyone put up their hands in horror and said, but this is a dry country. We don't have the water. And to his credit, he said, right, we need to work smarter, not breed more. Can I just, um, before we finish this, um, this conversation, partly through some of the questions and observations that were in the chat earlier on, actually, in our um, period, um, people were talking about the difference between um, having a child, of course, in the West, in the overdeveloped countries, and having a child in the um, developing or underdeveloped countries. Um, and Bill's um, statement about it has to be family planning, um, economic access and education for women, which everybody agrees with. Um, everybody agrees with that, I think, here who's been talking and has underlined it. But for those that were asking the questions earlier, you could pull out that that could be directed at those in the developing and underdeveloped countries um, rather than at those in the West. And we know that every child born in the West has, is a vast effect on the planet. Um, just to take the UK example, is a child born here is 12 tons of carbon dioxide every year, which is wildly different to a child born in Nigeria at half a ton currently. And um, so can we just ask you to draw out how the reduction in population could be, draw, um, could be played out, let's say in the overdeveloped countries? Bill, would you like to go first? Oh, I, I think I, I did try to underscore that egregious inequality is a huge problem here. And if you really, you know, if you were God and said, okay, let's deal with this through population control, and then reducing the populations of the first world by 20% would have a massive effect beyond any similar number of reductions in, in, in the developing world. So this has to be an across the board situation. We have to recognize that the first world is vastly overpopulated, particularly if it hopes to retain anything like the kind of material standards that we currently enjoy. But that does not relieve uh, the responsibility off the shoulders of developing countries. The only way the earth could support the present population in developing countries is if they remain poor. Because if they all reach the material standard of even middle income countries, you'll need three or four or five or six planets that aren't currently available in the marketplace. So this is not a problem that settles only here or there, it's a problem all of us must confront, recognizing that there's another element to this, that if we're going to get serious about retaining a population at around three billion, it has to much, be a much more equitable population, income distribution, access to resources, and the planetary abundance must be much more fairly shared across the board. So in addition to population strategies, we need economic strategies that, for example, uh, outlaw, uh, income disparity, no more than five. So that the chief CEO of a corporation can't earn more than five times the income of uh, the average shop floor worker, which by the way is about the average differential between the upper and lower pay levels within the Spanish co-ops, the non-regent cooperatives. In the United States, that differential may be as much as two or three or 400. So that's a huge thing that we have to deal with the inequity that is built into the kind of system that we have today. So yes, let's do what we must to reduce population, but recognize that the material underpinning to the planet also has to be more fairly distributed among the population, whatever it might be that remains. By the way, we could not sustain, overshoot means that we could not sustain the present world population, even at average material standards. If everyone today were utterly equal in economic terms, we'd still have to reduce the total consumption by about 50%. Yes. I'll pass. I'm busy answering questions in the chat. So <laughs> well, 
and I think Phoebe is always the most delightful voice to end the conversation anyway. So, you know, what, what I, I just want to underscore everything Bill just said. I mean, it, it's 100% right. What I really liked about Bill's charts is he didn't break it into developed world and developing world, right? He had four different categories to show, you know, what the actual numbers are kind of broken out in those segments. Um, and I, I think that's critical to understand. Um, because everybody kind of wants to make it, you know, pit pit two sides against each other and turn it into a non-productive conversation. And I think the data shows that doesn't need to be the case. The, the other kind of dynamic piece to it, I, I'd, I'd love it to see Bill's charts kind of uh, projected out into the future dynamically so we could watch it all play out. You know, a lot of the statistics out there is that you know, we're talking about a couple billion people from, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the poor uh, moving into the global middle class just over the next decade. And right. So those those four categories bill broke out like you're going to see big shifts, you know, from one category into a completely different category in parts of the world that right now we say, oh, you know, we, we shouldn't tell them they don't consume that much. You know, one of my favorite books is a social scientist Kishore Mabubani wrote a book called uh, The New Asian Hemisphere. And he talked about like growing up in the slums, you know, in South Asia and, you know, all they, they, they watched TV and saw these great things everybody wanted and that program, everybody, they wanted those things. So you have to think about the large cohorts of people that are going to move from, from, you know, a, a lower station in life to a much higher station, like just in one lifetime, just in one decade. And um, that's going to have a, a crushing effect on our planet between now and 2030, in my opinion. So if we don't begin having fewer people on the planet every year after 2030, I, I don't see exactly how you make the math work out here. Right. Great. Well, I, I should stop myself saying great all the time because I'm actually really great <laughs> and wonderful speaking by you or not great that the, we've solved the problem suddenly and it's all going to get better. Um, right. We're, we're running down for the last nine minutes of our extended period. Um, and we did set another question, which we'd really like to answer. And I think of Jane Sullivan's um, correct criticism of the United Nations. Um, but let's see if we can give them a solution. Well, one of the things the United Nations has is the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, there isn't one that, I mean, they can, can be applied to, in a sense, some things in population, but there isn't one that specifically addresses population. So should the United Nations have an SDG that um, reflects population or addresses population? And if it should, what do you think it should be? So Bill Reese again. Well, it, it absolutely should. And I have to comment on the existing sustainable development goals. Most, most of them assume, and in fact are dependent on the maintenance of at least the current uh, global economic system and its growth. So here we have sustainable development goals that are essentially in support of the very system that has created the need for the sustainable development goals in the first place. So I find this, again, a result of our completely illogical approach to the major problems facing us. Science plays almost no role here. It's political correctness. It's a variety of other special interests influencing the policy decisions. Jane described very clearly how the United Nations perspective on these issues has been distorted by outside pressure. The IPCC is exactly the same, grossly underestimating the pace and then dimensions of, of climate change because of hugely powerful political interests intervening in those discussions. So as long as we're in those kinds of circumstances, Chris is absolutely right. We're in a situation where we must do A, B, and C by 2030, and there's almost no chance of it happening from within the current uh, dynamic that, that we're talking about here. What was your question again? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you, you've answered around it in terms of the methodology. It's, it's should, should there be a sustainable development goal? You've told us, right, what should it be? Have we got a suggestion for the UN? Well, it's what we've been talking about all along here. Let's set a target. Let's make it reasonable. Let's base it on science. Let's say it's somewhere between Chris's three and my bottom line of one billion. And what must we do to get there? What are the best ways of short of a sterilization of the population? for moving in that direction. And the science is fairly clear on that. Everybody, you said it yourself or someone did. We all know what should happen, what should be being done. It's just not being done. And there are huge prohibitions to it happening from the Catholic Church to the government of the United States, which prevent these kinds of things from uh, taking effect in the world. 
Ed, this is one of the thorniest issues that we probably have to face. And, and, and yet we are just about out of time. We cannot afford the luxury of bickering, finger pointing uh, between consumption and population, or indeed organizations competing for attention, visibility, resourcing in the public space. This is the time where we need to build, if I can use this term, a broad church of organizations people at multiple scales, everyone needs to be able to move to the point of talking about uh, this in a transformative way with governments and policymakers. Uh, and and this, this is a steep hill to climb. So how can we do this, given that most people, as Bill confirms, are used to speaking um, very much from their own small self-interested mindset? we have to focus on the system effects that we need to uh, basically entreat others to become cognizant of. And <laughs> I don't know how we're going to do it, but we have started and we've got to uh, shame people that are finger pointing, bickering and finding a million ways not to do it. They, we're out of time. Chris, um, over to you. And could you, could you come and tell us, so what are we gonna tell the UN? What yeah, um, I would focus on the slope of the curve, not the absolute number. Uh, I think if we get the slope negative, we have a long time to actually figure out that number. Um, we need to emphasize that uh, we long ago exceeded our earth's carrying capacity. We've accumulated ecological debt, and that has to end. I would say 1.5 TFR by 2050. It doesn't mean no one ever has children anymore. It doesn't mean no one has no any grandchildren anymore. It means on average one to two children instead of two to three globally. Um, then that forces a lot of tough adult conversations amongst world leaders that are deeply uncomfortable. And they're about as deeply uncomfortable as telling everybody that everybody's going to cook cook in their own air and water in the next few decades. So I say uh, uh, have the 18th SDG be 1.5 TFR by 2030. If somebody wants to bicker on the math, I'm happy to have the conversation offline. Um, and, and possibly even, you know, as Rob Harding uh, uh, wrote once, you know, uh, a few years ago, calling for a United Nations Framework Convention on Population Growth. Um, you know, there's many moving pieces this. You need a framework to think about it. It's investment in women and girls. It's investment in, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 family planning technologies. It's a lot of different things, not one thing. So, so have a framework for it. Have real adult conversations about it. And don't let UNFPA and UNEP and, you know, you know uh, all these different UN organizations just kind of put their head in the ground um, and, and ignore it because, you know, th there's nothing sustainable about the SDGs until we deal with climate. Great. Until we deal with population. Sorry. Thank, <laughs> thank you very, very much, Chris. That's great. Thank you to all of our speakers. Um, I'm going to start drawing it to a close now as we're about two minutes from our extended um, period. Um, it's an extraordinarily difficult subject, which is so obvious. And once you've actually, I mean, you wouldn't have, many of the people here wouldn't have had to hear the speakers talking to know we are too many people on the planet and we need to address it. So it's, it's an obvious one. Um, I have to confess on my own journey, firstly, to being a Catholic, um, which means that my start of the journey really was the, the um, brush with the scientist's warnings. And then coming to, to the point of saying, well, being a Catholic or not, if the GP told me that I was sick in a particular way and I had to take action, my GP, my doctor, I'd get on and take action. And so I looked at the scientist's warnings and said, well, that's the scientist telling me that I've got to take action, so I am. Um, and to some extent, the Pope accepts that in the writings that he does on a lot of these. He's, he's supportive of what the scientists have been saying. The, the other thing I'd like to just confess, actually, is because Bill said, what politician in the world would, would take up the call and, uh, and actually um, work on any of these policies at all? And I suppose I should confess an interest as having just become a, a little politician, but effectively a unitary councillor, so at the highest level of local politics, um, in the UK, I suppose a state politics if it was in the US or whatever. Um, and I actually got elected on the only policy of climate action now. That was the only policy. And as far as I know from anywhere I've ever spoken to anywhere, I'm the only politician ever to have been elected with the single policy of climate action. But it shows a change in the electorate and in their, their appetite for doing things. So 
Firstly, Bill, I'll put my hand up and say I'm one, so I will be saying it. Um, but also that the electorate are now ready for people who will be saying these things. Um, and although population may appear to be fractionally more difficult to talk about than the climate at the moment, um, it comes hand in hand. So and I'd, I'd leave them by urging everybody here, as well as thanking you for being here, I would urge you not to be um, in the congregation of the converted who turn up to church already converted, hear from, from the very distinguished preachers who then tell you all the things that to some extent you already knew, but explain it to you in more detail and then go away and don't do anything on it. We have got to go out and take action on it. And it's um, a vast number of conversations that we need to do. And they can start locally in our church, in our parish, etc. And we can drive this forward. We have to go out of these meetings, um, taking the warnings on board and starting to take action, not just being a big group of the converted who are all together agreeing with each other. So please take it out and talk to people about it because it is a difficult conversation. And as a Catholic two years ago, it was tough for me to get started on it. Um, but with the, the scientists' um, warnings, with the um, scientific background, I addressed it and I haven't found people um, picking me up on it, even in church. They have in general agreed with it and that's the way we can drive the action. So, so thank you again very much to our speakers. So um, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Phoebe. Um, thank you, Chris. We are exactly on our extended bit of overtime. Thank you so much for everybody for coming. I'm sorry we can get through the exact questions, but we did draw out some themes, hopefully, into it that, that the, uh, the speakers then spoke at. And um, please, um, you know, go out and have a, rather than a happy, but a successful population day in which we move this conversation forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Wonderful to meet you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.